Hey, this is Jared Cochran with Family Church. Welcome to our podcast. I'm excited that you're here. I hope that God moves through this message to reach you so he can move through your life. Be sure to share and subscribe so that we can reach the world with God's word. Enjoy the message. Back. Oh, welcome back <laughs> to another wonderful Wednesday with no sound. Uh, it should be working now, but I guess we won't know for another minute and a half. So hopefully it is, and we're just going to go like it is. <laughs> uh, let us know where you're watching from. I got Mitch joining me tonight. Kelsey's at home with the kids. Uh, my dad, we have no idea where he is. He's just lost in the wind. So whew. I just sprinted, and now I'm out of breath. Uh, real quick, the events before we get going. We have the Fall Festival is this week, uh, October 25th, if you're watching at a different time. So that's this Friday, October 25th, um, from 5 till 6 p.m. This Sunday, we have a lot of fun stuff going on. I'll be continuing this lovely series, uh, just making everybody happy. <laughs> the food truck is this Sunday, the 27th, I think it's the Saucy Pig food truck. And then we have baptisms uh, also on this Sunday, immediately following church. You can register for the baptisms on our website, familychurch.social slash events. If you forget to, then whatever, I'll still baptize you, you know, we'll get there. Uh, we got a different tank this time. It's, it's a little bit smaller. Oh, there it is. I have my phone up. Sorry. Um, I'm just way thrown off now. Uh, yeah, so we got a new tank for the baptisms. Uh, smaller, so hopefully the water won't be quite as cold, but I'm looking, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to I it. Am. It's been a while since we did. I don't remember when the last one was. Um, but we had the pool, and then before that was last October, at the beach, and it is fun doing it at the beach until it's really windy, so I'm glad that we finally have uh, a tank that's not hours and hours to, um, Kelsey, I don't know what to tell you, just turn it up. I can't fix it now. (laughs) Um, It won't take hours and hours to fill up, but I'm excited. We We got a new person on the couch today. We haven't had that in a while. It's usually me and either Kelsey or my dad, I want to make sure. Yeah, it's on. Okay, good. Thank you, you Jesus. We're good. We're good. Um, so yeah, I got I got Mitch. He's um, when when did you guys start coming? March. March. I believe. Yeah, when we were coming down house shopping, um, we found this church. We started attending in March, and we officially moved in March like sixteenth, and we've been here ever since. That's awesome. Yeah, man, it's changed even a lot since March. Things have really shifted and changed. Yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> it's been crazy. I was talking to um, Jason earlier, who uh, helps us out on on the soundboard and in the production. Great guy, and he uh, it's quiet. Hold on. <sighs> what can I do? Here, you, you talk about yourself. Talk about myself. <laughs> Normally, I like doing that, but lately, I've been trying to keep it more about Jesus. But, um, yeah, Jared's going to go fix the sound. He's going to have to run, which he does not like to do. So um, pray for Jared and his running abilities. But, yeah, um, my wife and I, Amanda, we started coming to the church in the middle of March. Um, we've been here ever since. I don't know. We haven't hardly missed a Sunday, I don't think. Um, we've enjoyed our time here. Um, we moved from southern Indiana, the Louisville area, uh, and... You know, decided to come back home. I was originally born in Jacksonville. I'm a native North Florida person. Uh, My wife's South Florida. So we decided to come home and bring our girls somewhere where it's warm. There's no more winter. There's no more snow. Um, And so we're we're looking forward to it. (laughs) Kelsey. Kelsey says it's maxed out, bruh. It's maxed out. Yep. All right. Well... (laughs) Professional, professional, professional. Hopefully that's better. If not, we'll get it figured out next week. The family room is an incredibly low budget and easygoing operation. Uh, So yeah, we're here to discuss, contend, episode two. Uh, What did I, I didn't even say the title Sunday. I realized that afterwards. It was a necessary reminder, um, which you can see. If you haven't watched it yet, it's on our YouTube (laughs) 
It's, uh, I, I stuck to the time limit, so I was kind of excited about that. I was, I was mindful of the you time. Did. I looked down and was shocked, like, oh, it's not, it, even, hey, it's not even noon. Before noon. It wasn't even noon yet. New was, me. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know what to do with all that extra It was time. especially after the revival night. And if you guys missed the revival night, uh, obviously, if you're an online guest only, uh, you missed it. Uh, we will live stream the next one. But um, bring it, there we go. The, uh, yeah, the revival night was great. And then after that, it was crazy to go from, like, no time limit to... I finally you, stuck I mean, to the time limit. You hammered it. <laughs> so we, I will say, Amanda and I, we are excited at the prospect of not having to make commitments in the afternoon now because we're committed to Jesus. So it's like, hey, do you want to meet us for lunch somewhere? And we're like, honestly, I don't know what time. <laughs> like, what time will you be done? Don't honestly, know when we're going to I don't know, it's I don't perfect. know what time. We're too committed to Jesus to commit to lunch See? with you. So, so introverts, yeah. they would love family church because <laughs> you can throw your plans off and be like, look, I don't know when we're getting out of church. Yeah. I'm just going to worship Jesus. And there's no telling when we're done. So exactly, it's, <laughs> perfect it's for perfect. the introverts. It works on so many levels. YouTube is completely quiet tonight, so we're gonna go with the fam, the the family room with the Facebook. Uh, let, drop some quotes in. I know Kelsey's probably gonna say something about my bunny hop thing or whatever <laughs> that was. Um, but yeah, it was Jude verses uh, five through seven. There's only one chapter, so I typically I don't say Jude one. I just say Jude, you know, five through seven. And I'm already looking forward to this Sunday. Uh, but it was, it was fun. I, it was weird crafting the intro for me because I was like, how can I jump into making sure we have the reminder since that's what yeah. verse five opens with is you know, to remind you of things. And uh, the only thing that started popping in my head was just that Winston Churchill quote. And I was like, man, I think that would be a good... Good, uh, good opener and like a solid way to, you know, because that's something most everybody hopefully can, if not remember you, at least remember it from school. Exactly. I mean, obviously I wasn't alive during that time, but we all know the atrocities from that time period. So I thought it was a, a, just a, a nice way to enter into, hey, this is, you know, as important it is to remember this type of past in our Christian faith, it's also important to remember there are the false prophets out there that are completely trying to come against us and tear every part of Christianity down to the ground. So it's just, you know, it's, I mean, you know as well as I do, the, yeah. the climate right now in the church is just pat everybody's butt and it is. collect their tithe and it praise is. Jesus, that's it. And it's interesting too because Jude, like it starts out, it, it's not his desire. His desire is to talk about the things they have in common, which is the salvation. That's the desire, but the necessity was what's at hand, and often God does that a lot with us. His desire is not always to give us what's necessary for our lives, yeah. but sometimes we get those things that we call trials when really they're necessities, whether it is a remembrance or it's something we have to go through or we put our faith in, and the, uh, I think the quote was, was perfect, and like you said, we've all remembered it either from school yeah. or we've heard some version of it, and um, it is true. Uh, Amanda and I talked about it a little bit afterwards, and not only remembering the past, but maybe you can speak to this a little bit too, is part of it's remembering the past, but part of that past is also what one documented, two spoken. So all of us in this church and in this building, we don't always have a, a book or a history book about our past. So I think yeah. it's important for us, we talked about as families and nucleuses to talk with our kids and our other family members of what we went through. I think a lot of times we hide our shame and hide yeah. our sin. And so our, our kids don't have the ability to learn from the past because we don't talk about our past with our kids. And that's something where we've talked about when they're of age, we're going to talk about the things that we dealt with so yeah. they know and they can learn from our we try to We try to so. do that with, with the girls already, it, well, obviously within reason. Mm -hmm. You know, you're exactly. not talking to them about driving that much when they're 9 and 10. Right. But we already try to... Um, you know, be mindful of what you are telling them, but at the same time, like, hey, you know, um, like for instance, right now, one of the kids is, was dealing with a, a bully in her class. Mm. And, you know, it's, you gotta have that conversation of, you know, just, it, it, it's not fun, it's, it's never any fun to get picked on, but, you know, the more that you just stay silent, people will just walk all over you. So you have to find that courage within you to speak up in some type of, capacity that way you know eventually it'll shut them up and shut them down right. you know you don't have to immediately just resort to physical violence but right. <laughs> you know so it's 
it's a good thing though to have to have that with your kids and to even you know just the, the consideration of something like you know journaling something or like family albums. Mm -hmm. We we have the uh, the Amazon Fire Stick with our pictures on there that we upload because it does the screensaver on the thing. Yeah. So that's always fun just because, you know, you relive it. And it has the date usually as long as it was on the picture, which is crazy to think of. But, <laughs> yeah, so it'll go through and we'll just sit there sometimes. It'll go on and we'll just laugh at it with the kids. The kids will try to, they'll literally try to reenact the photo. Really? And, like, redo the positions. It's hilarious. You They're see all, like, the long hair a bunch you of nerds. Yeah. and everything? I had the, had the long Kelsey hair. to grow back out. It was really fun. <laughs> If you've seen that picture on my Facebook where I'm just completely drenched in mud, that was really fun to have just long hair full of mud, like John Wick if he yes. was just in a mud bath. So, yeah, she, I've, I've thought about growing it back out, but then I'd have to start wearing, like, camel's hair mm -hmm. to preach, to get, like, the full John the Baptist thing going on. Just, Might as well. <laughs> Mine as well. Might my as dad well. messaged me that earlier, or the other day. He was like, what are, you, what are you wearing to church? A suit? And I was like... Um, I was like, no, I'm going to wear camels there. <laughs> Just jump right in. But no, it's, it's a good thing to remember. And I think that's what's awesome about the Bible, too, is being able to look back and see. And some people hate talking about it like that. But to look back and see, not like, you know, finding yourself in the Bible, but seeing, obviously, the reality of the human condition. And you yeah. see people, you know, David... And Solomon and, you know, Jonah, you, you got Samson, just every, the, everybody's a mess other than Jesus. Yep. And it's just, it's, I mean, it's nice that obviously in our wretched humanity, God still steps down and saved us. I mean, that, that's, it's such a testament to his, I was talking to Jason earlier about just how patient God is. And he is. I can't fathom, I mean, you really can't fathom just can. the level of patience because- you get in traffic and you're like, huh. Yeah. <laughs> and when, and I think that's a big thing too when people, when you experience not only the patience of God, but you just experience God. And I've told yeah. you this a little bit about myself. I had a lot of, a lot of head knowledge, but not, there was a missing connection between head and heart to really um, understand that. Part of that was from, you know, your own brain's ability to be like, <laughs> hey, grow back out. here's a sin, like you stole yeah. a cookie from the cookie jar. You're mentally, you can talk yourself out, okay, it's easy to forgive that. When you do some unspeakable things or you do things that really hurt people and then you still receive grace and forgiveness, you're like, I don't, you really feel that I don't deserve this. Yeah. There's no way you can talk yourself out of that. And you come to experience that patience of God where he's like, you look back over your life, like he's made a way every single time. Every and he, time. And he puts people in your path. You just have to be willing and to remove your pride to listen to some of those people that, you know, God's put in your way and, and put in your path and, and take that advice. Kelsey said, push your microphone closer. That's, that's one thing, too. I love um, the, uh, the, what was it, Jude verse 2, or is it, I think it's still part of verse 1, where, you know, we're called, beloved, and, and kept. Mm -hmm. And just that, that key word, kept, there. And I know I honed in it on week one, but, like, Man, you think about some of the stuff that you've, you've, you've done or gone through or, you know, I mean, I think about times that I have came this close to death. I mean, I shared the, the one thing with line, and I've had several instances with line work where it was just like, I should not be alive. Like, dumb choices or whatever or speeding down, you know, the, the highway or a back road or, or whatever. And it's just like, man, God just, he keeps you. He does. You've got, everybody's got that purpose that he's got them to do. And it's like, if he keeps you and a testament to the grace and the love of, of God and obviously his patience. And it's, it's insane. That was one thing I was thinking too, of laying this out with, um, Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm -hmm. And just, I always think with, with how bad it looks in the country now and everything going on and just the open demonic and then the open acceptance of the demonic and then you read about Sodom and Gomorrah and what's the, I can't remember who Horrible. said it, but the famous quote that's like, if God doesn't judge America soon, he's, he needs he's, to apologize. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, man, how, how bad must it have been Yeah. back then? I and mean, you, you gave some, I mean, you, which is what I love is you don't, you don't hold back. And yeah. You, you told it like it was, you told what happened and the angels come into the city and the men and the young of all age come looking for them and it's, 
you know, it should wake people up and be alarming. So I think a lot of times we have a tendency to sugarcoat the Bible and yeah. cotton candy and make it sweeter to absorb. Some of that stuff isn't meant to taste good coming down. No. It's meant to make, <laughs> like, that's meant, you're supposed to spit out sin. You're not supposed to like it. You're not supposed to be able to swallow no. it and stomach some of that stuff. That's what I don't get with people. And, you know, when we sugarcoat it, then you also make it, you know, palatable for sin. And it's not supposed to be. It's supposed to be disgusting. And we're not supposed to even That's want a to good have way. It. That's a, I've never actually have it thought our, about that. Yeah. When we, it, it, when we, oh man, that's a good point. When we sugarcoat sin, it, it, it literally, I mean, you think about it, you sugarcoat something and it tastes good. Yeah. You know, I got dogs and that need deceptive. medicine. Yeah. You wrap it in the exactly. ham to peanut give them butter like, or, or that. And I wouldn't even think, because I remember I did um, a Daniel fast years ago. And I don't know if I've told this story from the pulpit or I've said it like 5,000 times, but I remember like coming off of that after it was a three week fast. And then I went to have a Snickers and I couldn't eat like the first bite because it was just so sugary. Yeah. And it's like, but when you're used to it, and you don't like fast, you'll eat it all day long. And that sugar tastes good. And you don't realize like how it's just literally rotting everything yeah. out within and, you. And that's the same thing And it doesn't thing take sin. long until you get more and more. Yeah. And I have the same similar experience in college. I started eating clean, all organic. And then after six, seven months, I couldn't even finish a cheeseburger from McDonald's without yeah. getting sick to my stomach. And then the next thing you know, not even two weeks later, I'm downing 12 packs of Sunkist again <laughs> because, you know, it, it happens so quick. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it, same thing it's wild. goes with sin in our life too. You start... You know, you get a palate for it and you sugarcoat it. And then the more we sugarcoat it for, you know, the ears of the people just so they feel comfortable. It's not supposed to be comfortable. No, that's, that's it's one thing that to disgust you. makes so when me you so depressed it, with the American church is just the level of comfort that we, we want or that a lot of people just expect in church. Mm-hmm. And it's like, the, the, you know, the, the scariest verse in the Bible, depart from me, I never knew you. You know, not mm-hmm. everybody that calls me Lord, Lord. And mm-hmm. it's just, man, to sit back and, and think and, and realize that there's going to be untold numbers of people that went to church every Sunday and they just yep. didn't get fed anything and they think they're fine. And man, that's, that's one thing. We, we need to be praying for their souls. You need to pray for their souls. And you think about that verse too, the response of the people when he says, depart from me, I never knew you, they say, but I, but I, and it was a couple of weekends yeah. ago when you had that sermon and we talked about, you know, if, if you're that old Fort Lauderdale sort of theology where it's like, okay, you end up in heaven and the angel asks you, why are you here? If it, the first response out of your mouth is anything in the first person, you're missing the boat. It's yeah. because of he, it's because of Jesus. And they sit there and go, but God, I did this. I prophesied in your name. I did these things. And we have many people that say, but God, I went to church every Sunday. But God, I, I didn't do this or I didn't do that. And, you know, but you also didn't make him the Lord of your life. You didn't wield, you know, your will yes. over to him so he could use it. So there's um, yeah, we need to so many in the church like that that have that. And I don't know if, if it's everywhere because, I mean, I'll, I haven't traveled all that much, but I know at least it feels like in the South because it's that Southern tradition, you know, mm-hmm. God bless the USA and, you know, let's go get hot dogs and wave our flag and then, you know, believe in God. And then it's like, it's almost like so much in, <laughs> so much in the South just stops right there at the yeah. belief of God. It's like, great, I'm, I'm glad you believe in God. I'm glad you believe in Jesus. So do the demons. Yeah. And they tremble. And I think that's, it's insane that for a lot of people, unfortunately, you look at like statistically the numbers that claim Christianity or whatever mm-hmm. it used to be in the U.S. And I don't even know what it is now. But it was like, I remember it was always just this crazy high number. Yeah. But then you look at the state of the country or just the world and you're like, there's no way this is correct. Yeah. And it's just, I think it just falls on, we say we believe in Jesus, but you know, we, of course we want him to be our savior. Right. Nobody mostly nobody wants to go to hell. There's always that one like completely misguided individual that thinks it's going to be a party and all the cool people are right. going to be there. And you're like, uh, no, yeah. but it just, it's, it's just, it sucks, man, to just realize that. Well, you look at those people too, and I don't mean it in like those people, but you look at the instances of people claiming Christianity and they talk about it and you can't help but think of the Bible verse where Jesus is talking to the woman. And he says, you worship and you know not what. You know, I, you say worship in this mountain. In my family, we worship here. And we have a lot of people that claim Christianity, but 
again, when you look at the fruit of their life and what they do, it's, you don't necessarily want to call them a hypocrite because when you say I'm a Christian, you're fully acknowledging you're not perfect. I, I have sin in my life. So to, to call someone just a hypocrite just based on that is, I think, would be dishonest. Yeah. But at the same time, you hear when they start to talk and you hear their fruit, like you, you kind of get that saying and you're like, you, you worship and you know not what. Like you don't really have a grasp. Like you said, you just believe in Jesus, but you don't, he's not the Lord of your yeah. life. And that's, that's the difference. That's the key is there's so many people that they think just believing in Jesus automatically makes him your savior. And obviously he is our savior, but I mean, I would argue if, if he's not your Lord, then he's really not your savior because right. you're not saved. So right. unfortunately, if you're under the belief that he can be one without the other, you right. get none. Right. And that's, it, it's, it's crazy that more people aren't, how do I want to word this? There's, there's not enough people that are grasping the idea, the, not the idea, the fact that the devil doesn't have to tempt you in really any other way other than to get you to just simply not focus on God. If he can get you to focus on anything else under the sun or believe anything other than just Jesus, he's, he's got you. Yep. And he doesn't have to tear your life apart. He doesn't have to... He doesn't have to get you to try to worship him as long as you just, you think you can have Jesus plus yep. sin, Jesus plus whatever. And it's just like, no, man, it's it, Jesus. It's just got to be Jesus. That's got to be it for you. It's got to be Jesus plus nothing. And, and that's, um, and forgive me for those, if you hear more of me, I'm, I come from a sports background, so I played baseball my <laughs> whole life. So I, I do a lot of analogies in my head, and I know it's something you've heard of, but we're at war. You've talked about this too. We're at war. Whether you want to acknowledge it or not, just like if you want to acknowledge gravity is real or not, it exists and your impact of it's going to be felt. We're at a spiritual war and the devil is playing a game and you're in that game. And it helps to know that you're playing a game. Some people think, I really believe that they don't, they don't think they're in a game or that if they decide I don't want to participate that they're suddenly removed from the game. Like, no, you're playing it whether you want to or not. And the devil has those two tactics. Tactic one is to keep you from salvation. That's his number one goal. If I can keep you from being saved, if I can keep you from committing your life to Christ, that's, what I, that's my goal. Yeah. If he can't do that, if he can't make good on plan A, his plan B is to make you so ineffective for God that one, you do nothing for the kingdom, and two, in your uselessness, you could potentially be a stumbling block to others and help them go to plan A, which is, oh, I don't want to live. That guy says yeah. he's a Christian or he's doing this. I don't want to live that way. And they reject Christ based on your visual and audio ministry that you have every day out in the world. And so you have to understand we're playing a game and those are his two main tactics and it comes in various formats. It's, but, you know, it's pretty, like I think Kelsey said earlier where you said, you know, Satan was beautiful. Yeah. And uh, he wants to lock you up in a cell and he's not going to decorate it you know, like a haunted house. He's going to make it seem like it's the mansion on the beach you've always wanted. Yep. And he'll shut the gate before you know it's time. Yeah, it's, um, that's what's <laughs> one of, one of his, uh, I would say one of his greatest tactics was just uh, basically convincing, I'd say the world as an overall that he's this hideous, you know, you think of how they depict demons in, in movies or art or video games or books or whatever, it's always just, you know, the super grotesque, evil looking, and that might be, you know, maybe how they look now, I don't know, <laughs> after their corruption, but it's like, in reality, you know, Satan, he, Lucifer looked beautiful. I mean, he was, the angels were not created to be, right. I know they're not, you know, the little men in togas and little babies with wings, like, they're, if you look up the biblically right. accurate angels, like, it's some crazy looking yeah. stuff, but... No, they, they're not. They're not ugly, and I think that's what a lot of people don't realize is the exterior looks great, like mm -hmm. sin looks great on the outside, mm -hmm. looks great to do whatever you want, and then once you go down that path, you realize on the inside of it that man, that this is where it's messed up, and yeah. you know you've got we've all got that void within us because we know that God is there, we know there's a Creator, we know there's something we're we're all created to worship something, and that's yes. why you see. You know, at secular concerts, everybody's lifting their hands and doing that. And then, but when we come to church, somehow it's mm -hmm. weird. Yep. And at a football game or whatever, 
And it's just we're all created to worship something. There's that void in us. And without Jesus, no matter what you have, I don't, I, Elon Musk, with as much as money as he's got, if he doesn't have Jesus, that man's still miserable in some capacity. Yeah, like, it's all going to burn up. Yeah, that. and there's, you can't take it with you. No. And it's interesting, too, the worship. My old pastor, he did a lot with Hebrew and Greek. And you know, a lot of those definitions also had word pictures that went along with them. And one of them for worship was like a dog at a master's feet. And if you think about that, like my cousin had German shepherds, and I was talking to a guy today doing our solar panels where if you have a trained dog at your feet, he's on command. He's purposeful. He's useful. And he's doing the will of his master by being there. And if, like you said, we're designed to worship something. You're, you're that dog at someone's feet. You're either at your own feet and worshiping yourself yeah. and doing whatever you're telling yourself to do or at the Lord's feet or some other, some other thing that you end up worshiping, whether it's a hobby, the devil, money, you mean fill in the blank, really, but um, you're, you're worshiping something, and that worshiping isn't just like, oh, I love this, and I, this is something I'm yeah. interested in. It's my life is constructed around achieving satisfaction in yeah. that purpose, whatever that, that purpose is. Um, and if you don't have that, you end up with the idleness. You talk about Sodom and Gomorrah, they had that ease and all that time. Like That idleness is not... It's not good to be to be idle as well. That's you know we could get to that topic a little and bit. Speaking of, because I just thought of it with Sodom and Gomorrah, because we were talking beforehand, and something I didn't dive. Remember, we, I didn't dive into it on a, on Sunday. Was and I don't know how I didn't. I guess it was because the distance between when I was talking about remembering things and the <laughs> at the end when it was Sodom and Gomorrah. But Jesus, you remember the the lady that he said to remember was Lot's wife. And you know they're they're fleeing Sodom and uh, yeah they're fleeing Sodom and Gomorrah as I, I can't imagine how that looked behind them and you know she she turns around and there's it's it's almost it, it's human nature we same thing with the Israelites I would say when they get out of Egypt and into the wilderness they're not quite where they need to be yet and so even where they were was terrible. And, you know, we, we all do this. I still do this with, you probably do it with sports. Yeah. I do it with my job. You remember everything that was great. You know, oh, like yeah. this, these storms, I was like, man, I remember, you know, going on storms. Like they, there was some fun aspects to yeah. it. Not the 16 hour days for two plus weeks. The people, weeks. the guys, the stories. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, you're with, you know, you're with your friend and, and it's, you know, your, your food's pretty much always taken care of most of the time. You know, and then you're just, you're working and you're making good money and all this and you remember all that stuff, but then you completely, you always forget like how terrible a lot of it was. And then just like that, like she turns around and she's probably remembering, you know, well, you know, think about it like today, like, and that my house is gone. All of our possessions are gone. I couldn't get our our picture albums. I couldn't get anything. I couldn't get any of my, my keepsakes, my sentimental things. Yeah. And you turn around, you try to remember all that, and God's like, no, you just, you were supposed to keep moving forward. I mean, talk about an overarching theme for just the, the countenance of the church in America today. And I think I've talked to you about this a little bit before, too. Like, camera, we're, like, I'm on the St. Augustine news page and listening oh, to people there. So and then toxic even now. listening to just lifers that have been in St. Augustine, you hear all the time, oh, the change. Yeah. There's too many people, the this. That's your Lot's wife. You're, we're too yeah. busy. The church in America is so busy looking back at what once was the church of, oh, well, we used to do church this way, or it used to be this, or this city is growing, and there's people in the city used to be less crowded. We used, no wonder we're frozen yeah. standing still because we're spiritually turned to salt because we're too busy looking back on what the church once was and how great St. Augustine once was. We're not, we're not called to do that. We're called to press forward and march and and to to run that race and we're too busy constantly oh well church used to be this way well we're not there anymore yeah and the gospel hasn't changed he's the alpha and the omega the first and the last he is everlasting he's going to stay that way so yeah the church and how we maybe do church or reach people might tweak a little bit but that's no different than god sending them out to speak to different populations to the gentiles to the jews there's different messages you're going to reach a certain audience i might reach a certain audience and so you know we we can't sit there and long for the past and like you said we're not longing for the bad things i'm sure lot's wife wasn't longing for all the bad times that they had and she's longing for the good times, but that's not what we're called to do. They were called, leave, don't look back. Yeah. Move forward, spread the gospel, stop whining, complaining about once what once was. 
That makes me think of the guy that wanted to follow Jesus, and he he wanted he was like, I need to go bury my father, and he was like, mm-hmm. let the dead bury their own dead. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people don't realize like he was saying, let the spiritually dead bury their own dead, but it's the same type of thing. Like, there's a time for this, but the time now is to move forward. And oh man, I forgot I forgot now what I was gonna. Oh, the, yeah, the church. Man, we're, we we get stuck in the past with everything, everything, and it's always it's always this big debate on, you know, contemporary music versus hymns, and oh, this isn't true true worship if it's not hymns, and blah 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 blah, and it's like, man, you, if we want to get to if you want to go down that rabbit hole so bad, to me, if you you have idolized hymns. Because to me, it's it's idolization. We end up when we when we get stuck on the past of anything from from music to pastors. You if you're stuck on uh, this one specific pastor and they're not there anymore, you've made that pastor an idol and you need to repent. And then the same thing with hymns. And I always look at it as the hymns were new once and yeah. people didn't like some of the hymns back then that we love now. The other side of it is if you want to go that far and be like, oh, well, only the old music is good, then you should just be only singing psalms right? and act like that's and, the only and thing And I love that, that you God said loves. one time too where it's like if you're just singing, if you're just listening to us sing, then you're at a concert. Yeah, because yeah. you're just listening to us sing. But if you're you know, being introspective and you're letting the words and stuff get to you, now you're you're worshiping, yeah. and so you know that, like you said, that is a preference. It's a preference. It's not it's not going to you know send anyone to hell or not. Um, you know there are just like with everything, the devil's very creative. We've talked about that. He you messaged or mentioned that in your message that you know he's crafty. They do it. They sneak in unawares. They're very very crafty with how they do it. So there is a time for discernment of okay, okay is this becoming a production like Six Flags over Jesus or is this truly just people using their gifts to glorify God and to get our hearts right for the sermon that's to come. Um, And so, but yeah, I, all that. I heard something actually today on that that was a good point. I never, but you think about it, but it's one of those things when you hear somebody else like break it down, you're like, oh, I didn't, you know. And he was talking about, um, you know, the, how it's the, the false prophets and the, the people that deceive us. And it's great, too, is, this is another segue, but um, when they ask Jesus, like, how are we going to know when the end's coming? And his mm-hmm. first words are, be careful that you're not deceived. Mm-hmm. But then, you know, he always says they come as wolves in sheep's clothing, and mm-hmm. we're all called sheep. Yep. And that's the thing that I think a lot of people don't get is we expect, and probably something I should hash on, I hope maybe Sunday if I can remember, because I, I find, now that I'm thinking about it, when I'm talking about the false prophets, I, I, I have that tendency to, okay, you got like the, the rainbow preachers mm-hmm. and all this, but we, we, it's easy to recognize those because they stand out more. Yep. But when you realize like, no, these people are wolves in sheep's clothing. So they're, they're going to come looking like you and me. They're going to mm-hmm. look like a Christian. They're going to sound like a Christian. They're going to literally have every aspect to a, to a certain degree that they look like a sheep. They look mm-hmm. like they're part of the body. And the, the thing that he said is just, you know, sometimes you need to, you just need to step back and watch, watch for the fruit. Because mm-hmm. Jesus said, you know, you'll know them by their fruits. And it's like, man, we need to, for some of these people, you need to be praying, have that discernment, and then, you know, take a step back and, and watch them for a season, watch for fruit. Yeah. And his thing, like, you know, the great point was, you know, I, I've never seen somebody plant a tree and it grows fruit in a week. Like, it, it takes some time yep. to see, you know, what they're going to be bringing yeah. forth. And it's, and, and it's that's hard. A, and that's a big word, too, for new believers or people that are going through big things where they, you hear it a lot, like, I believed in Jesus and I thought my life was going to change and you know, a week later, they end up falling back into the same sin or the same thing. And I was at a, was at like a weekend conference sort of um, thing one time, and someone was speaking, and he had a past with alcoholism and drug abuse and pornography and a bunch of these, you know, you name it, fill in the blank. He he kind of ran the gamut. And he said, and it stuck with me, he's like, I would like to tell you that after I got saved, I stopped sinning. That didn't happen. He goes, but I can tell you, ver- like, without a doubt, that after I got saved, I no longer enjoyed it. Yeah. 
And that's where we talk about that conviction where some people like, you can stand and like people will stand and like, oh, whatever. They can sleep at night, I think is how you worded it. Yeah. It was when he got saved, he realized that he didn't stop sinning right away, but he stopped enjoying it. That cocaine hit that he took didn't feel the same. Yeah. He couldn't look himself in the mirror. The, you know, the, the 24 hour binge of drinking didn't, didn't give him the same high. It was no longer enjoyable to sin. And that's something I think we, we look at as a new believer, you know, your life might not change overnight. That, that, that plant that's going to bear fruit isn't going to be there the next yeah. day, but you gotta water that you're going to start growing, and it. that growing where we've talked about is going to cause those growing pains. It's yeah. going to stretch. You're going to feel uncomfortable, and that sin is not going to feel like it once did. It's not going to be a place of comfort anymore. That sin is going to be a place of uncomfort, and that's what we want. From the, we talked about at the top. It's going to be disgusting. You're not going to want to have that feeling anymore, and you're going to hopefully want to spit it out and reject it. I think, I think too, that's something... Um, cause I've been, and I don't get, I mean, I've got Facebook. I don't have like Instagram, which is whatever. Um, and I, I see some reels every now and then on the stuff of like people like, Oh, you'll see, I don't even click them, but you'll see, you'll see like the, a video or something on YouTube. It's like how to stop sinning. And it's like, well, you can't. So that's, you know, that it's just, there's so many things now that, like Tanya said, if you twist the truth just a little, you'll be way off track, you know, like driving. It's you just touch the steering wheel like that. Degree. It's not that bad, but a mile and a half down the road, you're in the ditch. And that's something to, that's uh, a reason why we need to be contending for the faith and, and knowing our faith and knowing and staying in God's word is just because they can, they can twist that little thing yeah. up front and you don't catch it until no. three years down the road and now they've led you down this rabbit hole and you're completely off track and you don't even realize it because yeah. they just slowly, it's like uh, the frog if you just yeah, slowly turn the up water. the water. You can't, you can't boil it and put them in. You have to yeah. put them in and then slowly, and then slowly turn, it, turn it, up. it up. And I and think that's how the devil gets a lot of people. And it's exactly how the devil gets a lot of people because you can't, and I, a man and I were watching the movie about um, casting crowns she put on last night. So we were watching a documentary and one, the drummer was giving his testimony about how he eventually, I think, stole money from the church or did something. He's like, if you came to me in high school and said, hey, you're going to do this, be like, there's no way. But over a series of small events, you don't realize that you're getting, yeah. you know, you're getting more and more down the road. And the devil, the devil's very subtle. The devil is not... Um, like you said, he, he's not going to come at you always with a hammer. It feels like it because that's when everything breaks yeah. and we realize we got got. But really the whole time he's been just a little bit here, a little bit there. You think of um, think of Potiphar's wife and Joseph and, and the King James Version does a really good job of saying this. You know, She said she cast her eyes on him. There came a day where she cast her eyes on him and that's, you know, that, that's different because he started off as, okay, here's a new hired hand. Here's an extra guy in the fold. But yeah. well, then one day she cast her eyes on him and that's huge. And you think about the old songs, like careful little eyes, what you see. You know, her, her eyes were cast on him. They set on it's looking at him in a different light. You know, guys do this too, but for the sake of the story, she very much was, oh, hey, who, you know, she took yeah. notice of him like, oh, hey, he's looking and good. That and that happens And the Bible time. said, which is... There's, some, there's a lot of hardships with beauty. The Bible said he was well-built and very striking, very handsome guy. That comes with its own problems because everybody likes you. You know, a lot of people, I'm sure, like, so like in South Florida, the attractive people get a lot of breaks. They get a lot of things. That's not always good. No. <laughs> and so very yeah. subtly, she casts her eyes on him, and you start to do that, and you, you realize for all of us with sin, those next, those next little stepping stones that we take start with our eyes, capturing something they shouldn't capture, which manifests in our brain. And once our imagination and our brain allows us to go to the point of committing that sin or doing that thing in our head and being okay with it, then all the devil's waiting for is an opportunity. At yeah. that point, we just need the occurrence. If you're already, hey, you know what? I think I should try cocaine or I, I could try this <laughs> or I could do that. I wonder what that high really feels like yeah. even if I just dabble. Once you have that and you're okay with it, the devil just needs an occurrence yeah. and then he has you. And it, it just starts small like that and then it builds and it builds and it builds. And so um, it's very, very important that we are aware of those false prophets and we're aware of those little tactics of the devil. I got sneeze. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um... No, that's great. Uh, yeah, because, I mean, nobody, you don't wake up one day like, oh, I'm going to go rob a bank. But you slowly slip into 
just hanging out with the wrong crowd because you don't have maybe a great home life and you're just looking for attention. So then you find friends and then they are doing drugs and then you go from doing drugs to selling drugs or whatever. And then it's mm -hmm. slowly, next thing you know, you're, you're robbing a bank or whatever yeah. else. I mean, that's extreme, but that's how it happens. It's just that it's slow how, shift. Happens. Nobody brings it up to you like, mm -mm. hey, here's, here's how your life's going to look, you yeah. know, once you do this. It always, it always, like that, the sugar coating, it looks enticing, it sounds mm -hmm. nice, it sounds fun to do this, but it's only once you fall into it that you yeah. realize. Yeah, and I'll, I'll say from my own, my own account, <laughs> pridefulness, you know, me growing up being, um, I was good at sports, but I was very prideful. I'm somewhat intelligent at times. I can be intelligent, right? <laughs> at somewhat. times, my wife would say otherwise. <laughs> but a lot of that too has to do with our pride and our human nature to be like, well, I could probably get away with it. Yeah, I could. I wouldn't. You know, I, your wife, my wife, they probably watch those murder shows, Dexter, or whatever, where you've seen there. I know no, I've, I've done never it. Where, seen like, Dexter. where I'm like, I, th I bet I could get away with murder. Like we have those thoughts, <laughs> like, and we go, we let our brain go, like, well, I would do this if I did it right. Yeah. And so that pridefulness of I think I could do it and not have any repercussion, ultimately allows us to go. I think I could dabble in this and not have a. Problem. And you know what's, oh man, you know what's really when you literally just realize everything you just said, how you go down that rabbit hole in your mind of trying to justify mm -hmm. your sin and trying to do this. And, you know, oh, I, I, I could do it better than that. I could do it. You know, how did you get caught? You're so stupid. How did you? And yeah. it's like you realize I'm just sitting there and all of that literally ties back into what I say is the original sin is, is Lucifer's pride in heaven. I and thinking I would be because uh, it's so easy. I'd be a better God than you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like I could do this better. I'm going to be like God uh, was Ezekiel 28 is where that whole and it's crazy. And oh, man. Um, it just popped in my head because of ADHD, but how ADHD. the Bible says, you know, Satan blinds uh, people's eyes. So they, they read the word and they don't know what the word means. And you see this all the time with atheists, like, oh, I've read the Bible cover to cover 19 mm -hmm. times. And it's like, but you don't, you don't have the truth because it's not And the eyes are what the connected. doorway to the soul? Yeah. And doorway to the spirit. And it's just yeah. not there. And I literally saw this on the Ezekiel 28 thing. And I can't remember how, I looked it up for a second. And I was just looking at the, um, the passage, and then I saw this one guy's comment. And at the beginning of the section that it begins to talk about Lucifer, it mentions the king of Tyre. Mm -hmm. um, say this to the king of Tyre, whatever, paraphrase. But then the words in the verbiage, literally it goes back to the garden. And you can tell who God is talking about yeah. if you know. But this guy was like, oh no, he's talking about the king of Tyre. And I'm like, Class A example yeah. of how you just you just right. take it at face value, and you don't understand you know what it's saying. But man, that was just that's what popped in my head because it's like man, you listen to that, and it's that's what we do. Like oh, you know I I did this, or I'm gonna you know I'm I'm struggling with this, but I'm gonna go ahead and do it. And, you know God will forgive me, and yeah. we just immediately abuse grace like mm -hmm. that because we're yeah. well God will forgive me. It's like dude, what <laughs> what if you doing that is just the time well, God's that like that goes you know back what? to love. Yeah. Do you love God? And I think that's why it's such a beautiful picture. I mean, God, the orchestration of the Bible and his holy word is so amazing. But the picture that he gives too of a bridegroom and him and like, you know, salvation as a, as a picture of marriage as well. Like that's not loving. Like you do that to your wife or to your husband. Like that's not love. It's like, oh, well, I can do this anyway. She'll forgive me that you won't, you don't do that out of, out of love. And man, that whole saying, uh, it's better to ask forgiveness yeah. than permit. That's, All that, that's born pride. in the same, Just do, the what same you wanna, mentality. do what you want to do. And um, yeah, you know, and it's, it's interesting because I, I think there's a lot of people that, like you said, going all the way back to the beginning, we're like, oh, I believe. Belief doesn't matter. Like, I believe I like this girl. It doesn't mean we're in a relationship. Yeah. I can do a lot of things. I can buy her flowers. I could do X, Y, Z. But if she hasn't offered a relationship, I'm just a stalker. You know what I mean? Like you're not, <laughs> like, you're not in a relationship, right? <laughs> and just because you do those things doesn't make you in a relationship. So you yeah. get married, like you had an invitation to a relationship with Kelsey. And she's like, yes, let's, let's go into this relationship. Just like we have with Jesus, we have an invitation. And then you, you get married and you do those things out of love, not because that makes you married, but because you love her, you care about her, you want to honor her, make her life easier. You do those works. So tying into like, yeah, you can believe and you can do works, but if you're not entered into the relationship, yeah. then, He's not the Lord. Because that's like, 
I mean, it's matter. like the Pharisees. They got, they've got the works down, but they don't have, it's never been connected to their heart. They literally think that they can save themselves. So it's like, you know, yeah. it's like the, 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 the people in the relationship that's like, oh, if, you know, if I, if I take out the trash and do the dishes, you know, I've done my chores. And it's like, no, that's still yeah, that's just your fair share of owning a house. Yeah. And, you know, it's just that kind of thing. Like that's, and so often how people in church approach God is just, you know, oh, well, you know, I know Jesus, I believe in Jesus, I'll read my Bible every now and then, or at least on Sundays I'll listen to the preacher, and it's like, man, if you applied that concept of dedication yeah. to any relationship, not even your marriage, anything, just work, any relationship anything. in yeah. your life, you've got no relationship. And like that, like with work, if you just showed up to work one day a week, mm-hmm. I mean, unless that's, you know, I guess now it could be a job if you're like a TikToker or something. Right. But <laughs> if you have a real career and a real job that you have to show up at and you just, I, I'm not good at cleaning. Kelsey says she's better than me. I, I'm not good I'm at good cleaning. at organ. I can make things look good. Yeah. But. Oh, I can, no, I'm not, I'm, I'm not a good cleaner. Um, I like it clean. I'm just, um, it's, I don't have the patience. Um, but yeah, like with your job, like you just show up and then just disappear yeah. and ghost your boss for it seven days. Work. You're not getting it. And then it, with anything in life, I mean, the gym, you go to the gym one day a week and let's say you go there, you lift, let's say you do an entire body workout mm-hmm. and whatever, and you're great. You're sore on Monday. You ate good on Sunday, but now immediately on Monday, you're already eating like crap and changing your diet to, mm-hmm. to just trash for the entire rest of the week, yeah. how are you going to look? Like, you what's going to transform? <laughs> you could do so many analogies from the gym, honestly. Oh, yeah. That. Like, same thing. Like, you want to grow in Christ. You don't, if you want to grow your body, go to the gym one day a week and not doing anything, you're not going to see the same results. Yeah. You might get something or you might stay stagnant, but you're not going to grow. It's the same thing. And the Bible says what? We desire the sincere milk of the word. What happens to the milk if you leave it out all week? It spoils. It goes bad. We come in well, here. Well, even if you. We come in the church, we get the milk, and then don't we go have out it in the, the fridge, world. right? Like, we need, to, we need to stay in the yeah. word uh, daily so we can stay, you know, for lack of a better term, refrigerated so we don't spoil. We don't let those words where we get that sense of righteousness and we get that kind of high attitude where, yeah, we have this word in us, but it's spoiled. It's no longer good because we're not operating. Um, with fresh. And you think about that, just like with milk, like it has, it has that shelf life. Mm-hmm. And I mean, you could apply that to church. Like you, you think, and it sounds weird, but at least it, it works in my brain. Like your Christianity, it has that, that we'll just call it like a Sunday shelf life. And for a lot of people, they're taking, they're taking it out, you know, on Sunday, having the bowl of cereal and having that little snack and putting it back in. And Enough of that, like if you only, a, a jug of milk, a gallon of milk, and you only used it once a week, I mean, yeah, it's in the fridge, and it's good. I mean, it's being kept the right temperature, but it still spoils. It's only good for a certain time. You have to keep, mm-hmm. oh, you have to keep getting a fresh serving of it. So, you know, just the same thing with church. It's just, that's, I don't know. I feel like that's such a mentality I'm trying to break off of people. But that goes right into, if you were going to make that analogy, I look at that as you're putting the milk out, you're, you're using the milk for its purpose. Translate to here, you're serving. You're joining a team, you're doing, you're serving for God. You're fulfilling a purpose for his kingdom. If you sit in the fridge long enough, if you just occupy a space in the building and you're not serving, eventually you will spoil. You might be good for the first month or two, but eventually what a lot of people, when they do walk away from church, they go, well, I wasn't Phil, I wasn't, you weren't doing anything. You just sat on a shelf <laughs> You sat on a shelf and you didn't serve. You yeah. didn't do. You didn't do much. It's, and that goes back to the idleness and having that that sense of idleness. I think it's Proverbs thirty one twenty seven where um, they talk about that goes too with the parable of the sower though. Mm-hmm. Um, I, oh well, I do have my notes because I did that one off the iPad. But uh, I mean, yeah, that's that's the same thing with the sower where it's just. Um, You've got those those four different responses, and only one is positive. But mm-hmm. one of them is, it, yeah, it takes root for a time, but eventually it still gets choked it gets out with the weeds. And does other things. And, and yeah, it's got its purpose. It's it got is. the Christian that that's the that's the people that they'll come to church every Sunday. Yep. They seem really engaged. They mm-hmm. look great, 
You know, they look like they're a part of the body, but yeah. they're never really a part of yeah. the body. And then eventually like that, they just, they spoil and they fall away. And, you know, hopefully you're in a community minded enough environment that somebody will reach out to you. But yeah. so often in the church, people slip through the cracks and then we're just, we find ourselves, you know, two years down the line, like, oh man, you know, where'd they go? They just kind of well, fell things, off. Yeah, two things with that. I think one of that is where we feel like, oh, we don't, we don't want to offend somebody. So that's kind of like a courage and be bold for the faith. Um, but finding, I found the, the Proverbs 31, 27, um, she watches over the ways of her household and does not eat of the bread of idleness. And that's, you know, that's a piece of wisdom. That's a nugget there to not sit there and eat of the bread of idleness. Now, why, why would people eat from the bread? Well, you have comfort. The idleness is comfort. So you can sit there and say, okay, I can, I can pause. I cannot do anything. Um, fear of failure. I don't want to, I'm afraid to fail. I'm afraid to do something and not be good at it. So you sit there and you, you have this idleness and it, it's, it's all temporary. The desire for perceived freedom, like, oh, I get to do what I want. That's a prideful thing as well. But when you sit in the church and you don't serve and you don't serve your purpose and what you were called to do, you're going to spoil. You're going to sit from the, you're, you're going to have that idleness. And there's, there's a difference I want to distinguish between idleness, idleness and, and purposeful rest. Yes. For example, like my wife and I, when we moved down here, coming off of, um, some of our difficulties, we, I went back through Deuteronomy, I think it was 24-5 or 24-6, where they get married, says, no man should have a burden or anything placed upon him for a year after marriage. His job is to build that marriage and build that union for a year after marriage. And, you know, her and I both sat down, like, I don't, we never really did that. So we, we decided when so we came days, here. You yeah. can't get like a day yeah, off without right? needing to work to pay a bill. <laughs> exactly. So we moved here and we're like, hey, we're going to focus on us. We're going to focus on us. You know, she was pregnant at the time. We ended up losing that baby, which was horrible. But we're going to focus on us. We're going to grow us. And which is why, like, we came and we've, we've joined the church and we're here all the time. We haven't necessarily served a team yet because we were both waiting in concordance with God's word and prayer together to say, okay, now, now is a time for us to get involved. But we weren't, there's a difference between being idle. We weren't sitting there doing nothing and doing our will. We were doing what God put on our life to say, hey, you need to come together as a union yeah. and be a husband and a wife the way I've called you to be. And for me personally, to stop being arrogant, stop being narcissistic, stop being prideful and to be a, a leader and a husband um, and to be a father to my, to my little ones. And so there's a difference between being idleness, having idleness and having purposeful rest. Idleness comes in a lack of purpose. If you yeah. have no purpose, if you're just sitting there doing nothing, you're not, that's, that's idleness. But if you have a, a, you know, a plan or something from God where you're resting or doing something, that's, you're, you're, you're fulfilling a purpose that God has for your life. And so just want to make that distinct. Well, it's that like the Sabbath too. And, and the whole thing with the Sabbath, it, it doesn't matter what day. I think everybody gets so crazy, well, not everybody, but there's, you know, there is that group that's like so idolized on the Sabbath being Saturday. Yeah. And it's just like, man, you're just supposed to take one day of rest. And I could testify to this. And, you know, I'll, I'll be the first to admit, we don't always, you know, do it. Mm -hmm. But I remember there was one time recently where we did that and like did just nothing for a day. Like it was a day off. Like we didn't make the bed, just nothing. And it was like the most nice restful day ever to just like not feel like you had to do literally anything and just yeah. like rest. And it was, it was amazing. And it's like, you see why God said to do it. Yeah. And I think of that, like with the, the idleness and the purposeful rest. And what always comes to my mind is, you know, the verse that everybody's like, oh, just wait on the Lord, just wait on the Lord. And they don't realize like the word wait in that is not just like sitting and waiting, yeah. being idle. You're still supposed to be like serving the body, volunteering at church, you know, going out and doing things and praying for the, for the lost, praying for God's will. Just pray, like a lot of people, I think they think yeah. wait on the Lord literally means just like yeah. waiting in the doctor's room. Yeah. And it's not, and there, I'd have to find it. In my old church, we have pastor. We actually had bookmarks and I'd have to find them, but it was on these bookmarks. I thought it was fantastic. It was the 12 wills, 12 of God's will for every man at every point in time for your life. So we all have, you know, 
And we hear a lot, I wanna know what God's will is for my life. Well, there's, there's 12 things that are always a God's will for your life all the time. Go and spread the gospel. Go, you have these listed down. So when we, you say that, like, yeah. oh, I'm gonna wait and do nothing. And no, there's at least 12. You still have something there's, to do. <laughs> that you should be doing in the waiting and in the meantime. Just, I always had a problem with that too. Again, a sports analogy, I had friends who were like, well, if it's meant to be, it'll be. Like, not necessarily, not without the work. Like, you have to prepare your fields for harvest. You can't just sit on the couch and say, if I'm meant to be an NFL you know, yeah, player, no, I'm going to get work. drafted, but I don't have to go train. No, you still have to go train. You have to get your body right. You have to, you have to do things. It's not just going to happen without your, your work and your efforts. So same thing. Yeah. You can wait on the Lord, but there's things to do in the meantime while, while you wait that, um, they can take over and to go off on a tangent a little bit, if you don't <laughs> mind, if you don't mind the, I want to know what God's will is for my life. I want to, I think to, I think to the, the woman who just reached out to touch his hem, just yeah. such a small act. It wasn't grand. Just if I could just touch the hem of his garment and who he told to go get healed, go dip yourself in the river. So that's it. Yeah. I think so many people and so many Christians are looking for this, this kind of like angels come down choir, like, Oh God spoke. This isn't the will of your life. And yeah. it's some big thing of grandeur. I'd like to stop you right there. By numbers and polls, 75% of us aren't even reading our Bible every day. His will for your life is to be in his word. His will for your life is to, to obey. If you're not even, if he's put on your heart probably something simple, which is get up 20 minutes earlier and, yeah. and do your devotional. And we're sitting there going, oh, that's it. I'm not going to dip my river. I'm not going to dip myself in the river yeah. seven times. Like that can't be the will. Like you, let's start there. No, it's always, it's usually tied behind something <laughs> yeah, simple. Let's start there with a, a habit and a, a longing for doing those small things well. And then at that point, you might be shocked to find that he would place that bigger yeah. moment it, of grandeur it's in your it's life. It's like that but. seed. That's, oh man, I was, I was literally just watching something on that uh, this morning on, um, it was Philip Anthony Mitchell and he was, it, it, he did a podcast with the Perrys and I don't, I haven't really, I don't know really who that is. But it was great, and I haven't watched all of it. I've watched part of the first one and part of the second one, and he, he gives, like, his testimony, and he was talking about how naturally, and this is me as well, like, naturally just not not really the most disciplined person. Like, nobody mm -hmm. likes discipline. Mm -hmm. Like, nobody likes getting up at 5 mm -hmm. in the morning and doing this. But he's like, I, I liked the results of what would come from discipline, and that was yeah. something I actually today... I set my alarm an hour earlier. I was, I'm going to wake up an hour earlier and just pray for the hour and then go into studying yeah. or whatever else. And man, like the whole day felt better after that. Even like, yeah, I was a little more tired. Mm -hmm. I had an extra cup of coffee, but the entire day had a whole different feeling. And we yeah. had, and, and I don't want to like say anything because I've been asked not to as well, but there was two different friends that have amazingly came through for us uh, in just an awesome blessing. And that will be obviously returned to them, if not by us, by God. Mm -hmm. And it's just, man, the, 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 nobody likes to be disciplined. Like discipline, it's, it's not fun. It's not fun to uh, skip the cheesecake and, you know, eat something keto or yeah. whatever. I can't, I'm not the best to give diet analogies, but like going to the gym on the days you don't want to go to the gym and you're yeah. like, man, I just, I'm not in the mood, but it's like just getting there and doing something is still better than sitting and doing nothing. Yeah. And I posted it on Facebook, which I posted a lot today, but I had said something, the difference, the difference between, uh, the, well, yeah, the, a big difference between disciple and discipline Disciples only missing the in, yeah, the yeah. I in. So you've got to be all in on discipline in order to be a disciple. It was cheesy, but it was like one of those things like when right. you get it, you're like, oh, yeah, this is cool. Like the die in the middle but it was of obedience just, that your dad loved. The what? The die in the middle of obedience. Oh, yeah. You have to die to self and that your dad yeah, it's not it's not fun and like obedience is sometimes it's it's not fun. No. And like and just the whole thing with just um it's so often just tied behind some tiny act, like yep. the, the faith the size of a mustard seed, basically. Yep. Something like that. Just he's got leprosy and they're and he he didn't even talk to was it was it Elisha or Elijah? I think it's Elisha, right? I think so. I think it's Elisha. Yeah. 
whatever. Think, well, fact checkers. They don't know the Bible. Fact checkers. <laughs> but he doesn't even get to see him. He basically just sees his assistant, the secretary, and right then he's already like, oh, man, like most people will be like, well, I didn't come to see this person. Yeah. You know, they think like another idolization kind of thing. They think, yeah. oh, the, all the power is tied to this one person. It can't mm-hmm. possibly come through something else. And then the simple command of, hey, just, just go dip yourself in that nasty water yeah. seven times and, and you'll be good. And it's so simple. And I think so many of us, we look for that big thing to, to start. Like, okay, I'll start reading my Bible if this. Like, no, do the small things so then he knows that he can give you the big things. And I will pass her again. He, it was a big character thing for him. He was big on characters. Like my, you know, he, <laughs> a little rotund, a little bit. He would make fun of himself. He's like, you know, I God owns the, all the cattle, thousand cattle on the hill, but he only trusts me with one cheeseburger at a time because I, I put on the weight. I'm yeah. not, you know. So same thing in our lives. Like if we're not doing the little things, you want some big moment of grandeur for you to flip the switch. Like again, goes back to that relationship. If I had, if I was dating somebody and she's like, I'm never going to do this, 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 and this until you make me a wife. Are you going to? Take yeah. that gamble? Like, are you going to, okay, once that switch flips, then you're going to do all these big things? Or I need to see through the course of dating you that you are a wife. It doesn't say he yeah. who finds a girlfriend. It's like he who finds a <laughs> wife, right? Like, yeah. you are already a wife when somebody finds you. So, um, yeah, it's it's crazy to, to think about and that. It's, but it's just because we always, we always want the big, I mean, it's the entertainment value. Mm-hmm. I think mainly in this country is just, everything's got to be big and flashy and, you know, like that. Like, you, you said it, like, I'll read my Bible when. I'll read my Bible mm-hmm. if, you know, if God will do this for me, I'll do that. It's like, you're not going to bargain with God. Like, you're yep. either going to be yep. obedient and then you'll see the blessings of that. Elijah, it's, the, it's just the letter off. And um, you'll see, the, you'll see the, the blessing of that obedience mm-hmm. or you just, you're not obedient and you don't see anything of it. And I think that's, One thing I think, too, is like with ministry is so many people, like, yeah, in a sense, we all want the church to blow up. Like, if you want your church to stay small, you essentially want the the Holy Spirit to be dead in your building. Because Mm -hmm. if he's there, if God is in your building, if God is moving in your ministry, it's going to grow. People are going to get saved. Now, that doesn't mean it's God's will that you have, you know, a 40,000 member mega church because... Yeah, you might be good, but maybe he knows if you get to that level of success, you might start dipping in the in yep. the tithes and offerings and taking stuff out, and it might corrupt your soul. So sometimes, yeah, it might be God's will that he right. keeps you in a place for a season because you're just your heart's not completely right. right. And it's just, man, it's just we if we would just literally, I think it all it literally just could all just if we would just be disciplined, literally in reading God's word. Just starting there. Like, that is the baseline. Start there. Even just, if it's Proverbs, a proverb a day. It's like that baseline. Yeah, just something as simple as I'm going to wake up, like you said, 20, start, start 10 minutes earlier, mm-hmm. 15 minutes earlier, 20 minutes earlier, and just read. I mean, you can go through, you can go through Jude in less than 10 minutes. You yeah. can go through, uh, I heard a good one. He said, don't do it with Romans because Romans is pretty long, but pick pretty much any epistle in the New Testament, and you can read through it in one sitting in 20 yeah. minutes or less for yeah. most of them, depending on, you know, your reading speed. Majority, but yeah. Just something as simple as that. Just read, read through it. And his point, too, was like, read through it, and if it doesn't sound like your church in America, you're probably in the wrong place. <laughs> like, if, you're, if you read through, like, an epistle or something like that, and it doesn't sound like pretty much how your pastor would preach, like, you, you probably yeah. need to find a new pastor. Hmm. And it's just, man, there's so much, you think of that, I, I think I said it either last week, I don't remember if it was last week or the revival, but we're just like, we're gluttonous in our levels of information, yeah. but we're anemic in our spiritual, spiritual application. Yeah. And, our, and like that, like you said it earlier, and I, I thought about myself growing up in the church, it's like you get, you get all that head knowledge, and you know, I, I read the Bible cover to cover, whatever such and such time it's like you had that head knowledge and you could quote this and quote that but it's like until it connects to your heart yep and i don't know i don't know for you but like with my testimony of just walking away from the church and being Mm -hmm. i don't want to say like i walked away from god like an atheist like he was he was there but it just it wasn't you know he wasn't there 
kind of thing. Like, yeah, I was that Christian. That oh yeah, I believe in Jesus, but I'm doing nothing the, to the live rich for young him. ruler. You wanted to yeah. do. You didn't want to get rid of the things that you had. So yeah, you walked and away, I was just you know living sorrowful. life. I was yep. building a, a career with Kelsey, and yep. then like that, like he calls me back home, and for me. Yeah, I grew up in this, and, and you know it's wonderful when you got the head knowledge. But it's like now that it's now that it's connected to my heart. Finally, it's like everything. The, the whole lens shifts with how you view everything, and it's like learning it all. Like I literally, I came back, and I remember before I preached, and even still now, like I still wrestle with like every Sunday is is this enough? Like I I do not have enough. Like right. I'm not smart enough for this. I don't know what I'm doing, blah, blah, like all of that. And then it's still, when I come up here, that's why I'm like, God use me because it's yeah. not me. There's no way. I'll drop the ball every time. But like that, it's like it connects to your heart and then it immediately, it becomes all more real and it's like relearning everything, but like truly learning it. So right. it's like, for me, I feel like, because um, obviously I, I, I read it all before, but now like going through it again with the new lens and like just taking the time to slowly go through the Bible, it's like, it's literally like starting from square one and being, it sounds weird yeah. since I'm like preaching and everything, but like being like a baby Christian over yeah. again, you're just relearning everything. And it's just, man, it's, well, when it says, truly gets in your spirit, heart, that spirit it is illuminates beautiful. the words when yeah. you get that. And that's a big difference and that goes into Knowing of God and knowing God. There's, there's a big difference between knowing of somebody and knowing that person, experiencing that person. I think of, um, again, from my sports background, I played with in high school, J.D. Martinez, who was just, he was with the Mets. They just got knocked out of the playoffs. I but, was say, I, yeah. Yeah, so J.D. <laughs> Martinez, a lot of people in the baseball world might know J.D. Martinez. They might know some things about him. I went to high school with him. I experienced him. Like I, you know what I mean? So yeah. when, you, when you grow up in the church and you, you get filled with this, you know of God, but when he connects to your heart and you, you interact with him personally and the relationship goes, I said this before on one of your family rooms, which you don't have a relationship with your pastor. You're supposed to have a relationship with God. Yeah. A lot of pastors, kids, and just kids growing up in the church, they usually build their relationship with Jesus through somebody else. It's not a direct connection to Jesus. It's, I worship Jesus because my parents worship Jesus, or I love Jesus because people I love love Jesus. They don't have the yeah, you connection. don't have that. It's, it's just, not intimate. It hasn't clicked yet. It's not intimate. They just know of him, and they know of what he is told to have been blessed through the the people above them. But so until that clicks, you just know of God. But when you get that in your heart and you experience Jesus light bulb that's like oh I now can go directly to the father I don't have to go through my pastor or my yeah. pastor doesn't have to fight my battles and my parents it's it's me and God now and it, it changes everybody and that's that's the big change is going from oh, I believe and know of God to I know God I, I've experienced God what's the the uh, no like when the Bible says you know Adam yeah. knew Eve it's that intimate it's thing intimate. God knows you mm -hmm. he knows Every, he knows stuff about me that I don't even know. Right, exactly. <laughs> it's, ah, it's crazy. Uh, and it's just, that's what I love too with when you get, you know, that seal of the Holy Spirit, you get that illumination and revelation in the word. There's nothing like just reading something, even if you've read it like numerous times and then like cool. God just pour something into you. You did that for and, me this Sunday. And like, I, I'll end up, I'll just push away from the desk and you're just like, whoa. So you said something this Sunday, You, it's one of the things you gloss over, gloss over, gloss over. You said, and I never thought about it until you, you highlight, even though I read Jude, you know, however many times through where, you know, he talks about, and I, then you mentioned something like, they mentioned Jesus. Jesus brought you out of Israel. I was like, uh, I often equate that or picture it's just God and Moses, yeah. but Jesus was there and it's a mentioning of, you know, you hear on the Instagram, the, the Trinity, but it's a mentioning, okay, Jesus was there, Alpha and Omega, he was there. And as many times as I've seen it, it's never really clicked that like, oh yeah, it was Jesus. It wasn't just God or just Moses. It was Jesus was there. Jesus brought you out of, out of Israel or out of Egypt, um, brought the Israelites out of Egypt. So that was, you said that and that's kind of illuminate. Like, oh yeah, I didn't. Know. There's that's it's oh, there's so much in in the Bible. That's what I love. It's like no matter you you never 
you cannot, you should not, and any do not fall into the trap of like, oh, I've I've studied it for I don't care fifty years. Doesn't matter. You can't just. I know everything there is about yeah. the Bible. Like that is you. You don't. You, no. you can't. Like there's something God can always, and it's not that it changes, Mm-mm. or that there's new. Like you can't get new. It's new to you. Right. But when somebody's like. Oh, I've got revelation that no one else has ever heard of. Like, no, you're just wrong. Like, that's right. not how that's not right. how the Bible works. <laughs> Unfortunately, well, fortunately, there's no there's no like oh I've, nobody's came yeah. up with it. Like, no, you know, God's word says there's nothing new under yeah. the sun. Like, I can't say I might say it in a different way than someone else has said, but it's still the same truth. Yeah. So you can't just magically know it. But yeah, like that. Like, I, and I didn't ever. Yeah. You you read the story and you're just like, okay, God, yep. you know, taking care of Moses. And the Israelites, and you just think, yeah, you don't ever consider, like, no, Jesus was still there. And then, um, have you ever seen the, we'll go on the rabbit hole on this for a minute, but uh, have you seen the real, we're in negative time now. (laughs) They don't Have you seen the real where, and I'm not saying, like, I fully buy into this, but I do like things that make my brain think. The real of uh, when Jesus is on the mountain um, with Peter, James, and John, and he gets transfigured, and he meets Moses and Elijah there. Mm-hmm. Have you heard the theory that when he was there... They're meeting in their They're real, meeting, in like, their when Moses was on times. the mount, and he saw Jesus, right. which it, does, it just says the angel of the Lord... Right. And then um, that theory, and that, then yeah, the theory that it was like a, a even though they were like all there, they were in time, their respective times. Yeah, and there were timelines, just <laughs> like in the whole idea being that you know God is outside of time. Yeah. Uh, that's crazy to me because it it's like man, it it could. It, yeah. <laughs> God's that yeah powerful. It could. And it's just something that like blows your mind to think like yeah. this that could have been a thing. Like everybody it, was it doing been. their thing. I, I do the same. I like I like having. My brain yeah. tease, like just to think about it. It's something I also have to be be conscious of because I think you and I both do it really well in terms of how we can imagine yeah. and think and, and we can go down these rabbit holes. And that was one of those things we have to be conscious of too. The devil can get us through our strength. Yeah. Our strengths are out of control. So most often I find <coughs> that people, our biggest weaknesses are typically come from our strengths that have no guardrails or they're out of control. Um, it's another sports analogy coming your way, baseball player. <laughs> one of my biggest strengths was contact. I didn't, yeah. I didn't swing and miss much. That was a huge strength for me. But if I didn't control that, if I didn't learn to have a good eye and be patient at the plate, whatever I decided to swing at, I was probably gonna hit it and put it in place. So if I swung at bad pitches, I don't get a second chance. The other guys on my team might swing and miss and they get strike one and they get another shot at a pitch. If I chase a bad first pitch that's low or out of the zone, odds are I'm going to make contact with it, not good, and I'm probably going to be out. Yeah. So I have this great strength of I can make contact with anything, but if I don't learn to control it, it becomes a massive weakness and yeah. I'm getting out on everything. So we have these great imaginations or some people have these great abilities to do things, but if we don't have the guardrails of God in our life to kind of give us a purpose with them, they become out of control. They can become some of our greatest weaknesses. That can hit, I think, of something I just did recently, and it can hit, that can hit with as simple as just reading the Bible mm-hmm. but not studying the Bible. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I did the, the um, No Time to Die sermon, and how Acts 28, when um, they were throwing the tackle off of the yeah. boat. When I first read that, like before I dove in to like see what things were, uh, I read tackle in my mind in today's thing. I was like, okay, they threw off like, stuff to catch fish, food. Fish. So I'm like, yeah. okay. And I remember I like started typing a note like, yeah, the, you know, the situation was so bad that, you know, they were getting rid of their own way to provide sustenance for themselves. And I like started and I was like, no, I, I need to look that up. Like, yeah. uh, obviously God stopped me like, no, don't, you know, before you make that error. Right. And then you look it up and you're like, oh no, it's furniture. So like you, right. you, yeah, like that, you can read it. But if you don't dive in to see what it is, your imagination will run completely the wrong direction. Mm-hmm. And I would have, st- I would have stood on stage and made this huge point and been completely wrong. 
And then, boom, I'm a false prophet. So, <laughs> yeah, Amanda said the Red Sea being a symbolism of baptism, too. Never I never about thought that, about that until yeah. studying for this. Interesting. And I didn't think about that at all, just the, the parting through, yeah. through, that, through that waters and then so coming out the other side. Out. Yeah. And, and that, then that. It's all discipline, too. Yeah. And that goes back to what you said, too, about the, the tackle. You had the discipline to say, okay, let me go back. Yeah, and uh, yeah, discipline's not fun, and uh, we need to we need to think about that discipline. And I think a big one too for us is so many people we're in a war. And I think too many Christians prepare for a battle, and what I mean by that is you said set the alarm twenty minutes early. Yeah. If you can't even get up twenty minutes early, let's just work on not hitting the snooze three times. Let's hit it twice, yeah. right? Let's start small. Um, Let's start small and, and build on the accomplishments because, again, when you hit those goals, it releases that dopamine, you know. But, um, yeah, we, we can't do that. And I think so many Christians, they, they wear out or they get tired because they, they build themselves up for one battle. The devil's relentless. He's not going away. And then they, they fall like, oh, I can go to this bar even though I have a drinking problem for this one night and they don't realize yeah. it. It's going to wear you down. And you need to have the whole armor of God. You need to be in the church. You need to do things. And you need to be disciplined with your actions and what, you, what you're choosing that's, to do. Um, that's the unfortunate thing I've seen with people in addiction. And they go into either you know, prison or rehab. And they have that tendency when they get out and they're clean because they detoxed and whatever mm-hmm. else. But they have the tendency to immediately jump back into a relationship or yep. friends with who were their friends. Or they have, it's got to be some type of tactic with the enemy, just that um, they don't, it's almost like people, even if they never met this person before, now they're clean and then this person comes into their life, but they're also a recovering drug addict. And yes, it probably can work out in some situations, but pretty much every situation I've seen is when they get connected, one of them ends up failing and it drags both of them down. And, I mean, it's just that, like, the discipline. And even if you, you know, hit the snooze button a little less or maybe you still slept in, it's still a conscious choice on, I would argue, most of us are probably using Spotify or Apple Music nowadays or Sirius, whatever. If you're not blasting off of your Bluetooth, you know, put on a Christian station. Uh, Mm -hmm. Shout out to Keith. I was riding Kelsey's dad. When we dropped off her Jeep yesterday, um, he was like, something went wrong with his radio, and then we were talking, and then he, it, was the, it was the coolest thing. He got so excited to walk me, because like, he wanted his station on, yeah. and it was a Christian station, but it was so cool. Like, he was so excited. Like, he was telling me how to get there, and then like, once it popped up, and it was like the name of his favorite one, he was like, yeah, that one. He was so <laughs> excited. I was like, man, that was cool. Um, just that it was like a Christian station, he was excited about it, but it you know, cool. you think... On your phone, you can put the Bible app on version, or if you have our app, we have the Bible on there, and it'll read to you. So mm-hmm. you could literally get your Bible reading in on your commute to wherever. And because I know, like, some people, and I won't say names, not, I'm not saying it's Kelsey, but some people, like, in some of the group chats we have with the church, they have a hard time reading because not everybody's like a big reader. And that's me. I don't. Yeah. Like it's hard. You have a hard time reading or, you know, you'll start reading and immediately just you you want to fall asleep or something like that. And so like just being able to listen to the word, which is great too, because yeah. they, you know, the Bible says faith comes by hearing the word of God. So right. even then you get more faith or you get faith. I don't want to say more faith, like starting levels here, but you get faith by literally just listening to the word of God. So I, I think it's awesome that there's, there's a way you can do it that can literally meet you yeah. on whatever level you need to be met at. Like mm-hmm. if you want to read, you can read. If you want to listen, you can still get the word. Yeah. And just by listening, I, it, it's awesome that we have, we live in a time that there's that much resource available for us to do all of this. And that's it's important. Great. It's important what you put in your ears. I think there was a, it was popular a couple of years ago. There was a science, there was a 
post about a science topic or science project where they had different plants and yeah. spoke to the plants and what was one was told I love you, one was told you're ugly, and that's and everything else, all the other variables were held constant and they grew and and blossomed at different rates. And you think about what are the lyrics and the words in your ears telling you and making you blossom into. Um, so it is important whether yeah. it's the word or at least some Christian. It's music. literally a gateway. It's it a is. It's a hole into mm-hmm. who you are. I mean, you can think it's your eyes, your ears. Like, it's 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 a hole into your soul yeah. pretty much. I mean, it's just a way for things to get in. So, yeah, like that. Like, and God said, or Jesus, yeah, well, God, Jesus, you know, he said, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. And that's not like, you know, literally ripping your eyeball out, but dealing aggressively with it and making a conscious effort. Like, yeah. if you know you have a problem with going to certain websites, Go and put the adult filter on or whatever where it's like you're a kid, so you can't go to the website, you know, or anything. And that's, it's crazy the time that we live in that it's easy, it's it's easier than ever to sin Mm -hmm. because you can open up your browser and go to whatever you want or you can open up the Bible right next to the browser Mm -hmm. and study God. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a crazy time that we live in. Yeah, it's all right there. And so even, I'd even say too, if you... If you struggle with reading or anything, I urge you to be quiet. I, I was so guilty of this too um, for a long time, trying to seek the will of God and just talk to God and do devotionals where I do my devotional, I, I pray, I read, or I'm in the car and I do all that. And then when I'm done, on comes the radio. Even though it's a Christian song, on yeah. comes the radio. He's a still small voice. It's gonna be hard to hear him if I constantly tune him out yeah. and put other things into my ears. Um, so I'd say it's also important to not only have that time, but have, it's sometimes uncomfortable, but sit there in just silence. in silence, yeah. Sit in silence and just see what comes and talk to God. And, and so it's, it's important to do that as well, I think. And it's, yeah, like you said, it, it's uncomfortable. That's actually something I did this morning. I was, um, when I woke up earlier and I was praying, and then, like, even in your prayer time, just, like, we get that weird, because t- prayer gets weird sometimes, you know? Like, it is, a, and people want to act like, oh, it's, like, blasphemous to say the Bible or stuff is weird. Like, no, there's weird aspects to this. Mm-hmm. Like, it's weird to just talk into mm-hmm. nothing, and, you know, and, but it's like, you know, you, you sit there and, like, so often in prayer... I don't know if it's for everybody, but for me, a lot of times it's like, if I'm not saying anything, like it just feels weird. Like, right. you know, like you're like, I, I'm, it's, I'm praying, I'm supposed to be talking. And it's like, mm-hmm. we don't like that. You don't think about the other side of the conversation where it's like, you, you got to shut up at some point and let God be able to respond. So like that, it's not comfortable. And, you know, you're sitting there and you pray and you just kind of like stop and you're like, just kind of hanging out in silence. Yeah, it's big. That's where I had... So like you said, we lost Jordan, what, three weeks ago now? Yeah. Baby, uh, beautiful baby girl, stillborn. And going through that, I, I was the one who was tasked kind of with driving back and forth between the house, getting things, you know, phone chargers and things for the hospital. And I, I told you about this. And I had that, that moment of almost an audible voice of, you know, from God in the silence where I, trust me, I had my time of prayer where it was, I lost my voice just yelling. <laughs> and it wasn't yelling like mad. It was just. Yeah, I've had those where you, you just, just get going like and then you're like. Ball, I, had, I almost had to pull off the road. But in the silence, that's where the one where I had where God said, when you sat there, when you sat there in that ultrasound room, staring at the screen, looking for a heartbeat, and it was just gray and black screen, and you're just waiting for a flash, just a pulse. You remember how you felt in that room. You know how you felt. And it's like, yeah, obviously. Like, just give me something. Show me something. Show me some life. Please, beat, beat, beat. That's all I kept thinking. And he goes, now you know how I feel. Looking down at my creation in heaven, waiting for the hearts to come alive of my people. So many of them are just dead. And I'm waiting, just begging and pleading. And the Bible says, constantly devising means to where you may come to Jesus to say, beat, come alive for Jesus and beat. So you, you guys are, he goes, you guys are dead in the world. Your hearts are dead. You might be alive. You're alive in church, but you are dead. And I'm waiting for that heartbeat and that monitor here in heaven to turn on so I know I have you. And uh, for those that may have turned off, 
please resuscitate. We need those paddles. Get reignited and, and want those, those hearts to beat. And it's, it's in those moments where you can get kind of those things from God where it's like, wow, this is, this is bigger than us. And um, this is about the people and this is about God's will moving in, in our church and in our community and in our lives in general. So, um, yeah. I think... Lean uh, into those moments. I think, I love the, the, that analogy of the, the paddles and shock, shocking people back to life. Yeah. Oh, we're doing a good job of shocking people back <laughs> to life here. And, well, that, and that's where I was headed is just, I think, and not, like, I'm not trying to toot my own horn because it's not about me, but, like, what I'm enjoying seeing from here and from some, some other places I watch is just this, the... It's, it's like, the, like the John the Baptist thing, like the voice crying in the wilderness now. And it's just, we're like turning now, some of us, and I wish more, I hope, I pray that America gets more voices where it's just, we're, we're turning towards like get, getting rid of like all, you know, like the programs and the entertainment stuff in churches and just all the extra fluff and just simply preaching and walking through just, just straight truth, like... Yeah. We don't need to add any, we don't need eisegesis. We just need exegesis. Just here's what the word says. And then just letting it marinate and like preaching off of that. And we're not putting all this extra stuff into it. And it's like, what's crazy is it, it needs to be the norm and it's not. And as mm-hmm. soon as we get the people that have like that spirit like Elijah and the spirit like John the Baptist, and it's just, we're just simply being the voice crying in the wilderness, preaching just God's truth. Like these are God's words. This is what it says. This is what he says. It's so out of the norm for people that it's literally, it's for a lot of people, it's mm-hmm. that it's that refreshing, cool water. It and is. for the other ones, they want to reject it because I think like you said, like they're just, they're just dead. And mm-hmm. so it's, it's so literally just shocking mm-hmm. that it's, it's shocking people back to life. And I think what's nice to see is that, you know, it's just, it, it, that, it's just that. It's just, it's God's truth. It, we don't need anything other than just like genuine worship it's, and just accurately, biblically proclaiming God's word in just its truth. And just, mm-hmm. it doesn't have to be fancy or what, or, you know, super deeply theological just no. here's God's truth with with just that and you just let it sit and it's like that's literally you see it with with some of these churches that are doing that and it's like they're seeing people come and yeah. it's like that's that's all we needed is just yeah. but we got away from it I think of and I don't remember where it is in the Bible but where they the the temple I think is in ruins and then they find the book of the law like hidden somewhere and it was mm-hmm. buried under all this stuff and rubble and covered in dust and then they you know they bring it out and they it's just been neglected for so long and then if i'm remembering correctly they go to i want to say it's around hezekiah's time but they go to do the feast and they're not doing the feast like 100% correct but god still counts it as righteous because their hearts were in it they weren't yeah. They weren't doing it correctly, which is something that, you know, we tend to do and he works on us. Like you Mm -hmm. said, you don't stop sinning immediately. He, he works on it with you. That's why it feels bad. And, uh, you know, that's another thing. I heard a story of a guy that when he got saved, uh, him and his girlfriend were living together and doing what goes along with that. And, you know, didn't feel bad, but he said the minute he got saved, and they celebrated getting saved. Right. He was like, I immediately felt wrong. Yeah. And he was like, now I realize like, oh, I, now that I have the Holy Spirit in me, I see that this is sin, this yep. is wrong. And it's just, that's what it does. It wakes you up to the reality of your sin. And then, I mean, it's, it's your choice of, you know, am I gonna repent from this and have God work mm-hmm. on me with it? Or am I just gonna, oh, you know, he'll forgive me kind of thing. And it's crazy, but I think, I think just, these voices crying in the wilderness of just, here's the truth. This is what we've been missing mm-hmm. for so long because yeah. it's easy to go to church and you can get, you can get a great sermon yeah. and all that, but then when you step back and you realize like, well, this is it's good, but it's, it's not like, it's not hitting mm-hmm. how I need it to hit. Yeah. It's there, but it's, it's not all the way there, you know? Yeah, that makes and sense. That, it goes back to even what we talked about a little bit ago where 
like the Sabbath, people arguing over the Sabbath a little bit where, oh, I'm gonna do this or it's on this day or that day. The heart, where's the heart? God's, you know, where's your heart at? Um, so many people, even I'd say this to people, I'd caution people in the church as well that serve. And they're like, oh, well, I serve, but you're not serving out of a heart of gratitude. You're serving out of a heart of you have to. Yeah. And that's not what God wants. God wants you to serve out of a heart of love and gratitude, and he, he measures the heart, not just the action. And so uh, be, very, be very mindful of, yeah. of, of what you're I doing there. Actually talking about, I was talking about that with uh, Jason earlier this morning at like six or something in the morning yeah. about the, um, I wonder if I can find it, just the, that whole heart check behind all of your, your attitudes and your, your serving yeah. mentality. Because let me tell you, the, de- the devil would love to see you in here on Sunday. Oh, yeah. Miserable. Because he would, oh, love, yeah. he would love to have you in here miserable on Sunday so everyone else could see how miserable it is to serve Jesus. And that's the image that he's going he's gonna to give off. So, yeah, be very mindful of that and very cautious of that. That's what, um, <clears throat> Ephesians, I mean, you know, t- Ephesians 2, 8 to 10, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Lest any man should boast. Yeah, not, not a result of works. Yeah. And... It's just that heart check of, you know, that's the double-sided coin because you get the people of, yes, faith without works is dead, Mm -hmm. but then you have the other side that thinks, you know, it's all legalism that Mm -hmm. you have to do this, you have to be doing this. And it's like, well, you don't exactly have to, but when you You truly are saved, you're led to do those works. It goes back to the marriage. Yeah, exactly. Just because you do all the things of a married husband doesn't mean you're married unless you're in that relationship. The right right mindset behind it. Because you can go do all the chore list you want hoping for the benefit of it. You're not going to get it. And if you're not, you know, I mean, yeah, you you can do... I could do any chore, whatever, but if you're sitting there just uh, grumbling the entire yeah. time, you're, you're not doing it for the right reasons. Mm-hmm. So I think that's good. Yeah, it is. The, the air turned off, and it's getting warm in here now. So I mean, we can keep going. I don't care. I'm hot. No, I'm hungry now, and I got to get home to the kids. <laughs> um, no, that's, that's great that we've went we about as long time. as me and Kelsey go. Yeah, <laughs> the one thing I, I will say, um, and it's been on my heart a lot when you say about the boldness, to the church and those watching, and in general, um, being bold, I think we, we, we talk a lot about courage, and a lot of it's fear, and I, I heard an analogy a, a long time ago about someone telling a story of, they jumped in to save a, a kid from a frozen pond, 20 degree water, iced over, kid breaks through, and every one of us said, I would jump in that pond, and you, you know, the person's like, I'm not a hero, I'm like, why would you do it? Well, I loved it, it was my son, like, I loved, there was no fear in jumping in that water because the love was so strong for that kid. And I think of, was it 1 John 4? I think 418 in, in 1 John, where perfect love, there is no fear. And perfect love, perfect love casteth out fear. And so I, oh, you I would- King ur- James in there. Yeah, so I would, <laughs> I would urge you as, as a church and as Americans, or anyone watching this, that if you find yourself- struggling to be bold. I don't know if it's necessarily a courage issue. I think it's a love issue. And you think of Jesus going to Peter, like, Peter, lovest thou me? He asked him three times when he comes, then feed my sheep. Lovest thou me? It's a love thing. How much do you love Jesus? If you love that person enough, you would jump in in an icy lake to save them, right? So we talked about people slipping through the cracks and leaving the church, and like, I don't want to offend them. Do you love them? Do you love Jesus? If so... Do the, will of, do the will of your father. Make sure they don't slip out. Go talk to them. Share the gospel. Don't be afraid to share the gospel. You talked about too. You don't have to be perfect. He wants your heart. And most people don't need, you know, a whole yeah. dissertation of the Bible. Just like when I go to buy an iPhone, I'm not asking you for all the specs. I want to know how it works for you. That's your testimony. Yeah. How does Jesus work for you? And so I'd say if you're, if you're struggling with being bold, don't necessarily ask for more courage. Ask for more love of, of Jesus so you can overcome that fear um, because that's that, good. that perfect love will overcome that fear that's and, good. and get you um, in a path where Jesus can use you, I, I believe. And, I, I, and I, I'll testify just for myself because um, I know like it was one thing like, yeah, I feel called to preach and, and do this and all that. And it took me forever to, 
you know, you, you get to, or at least for me, and I think for some people, like with sharing their faith, they're like, oh, I don't, I don't know enough of the Bible. And mine was like, well, I don't, I don't know enough. Like, I got to get all this stuff perfect before I get on the stage. And it was like, man, eventually it was just, you know, if, if I if I go after it with this mentality, I'm going to psych myself out You'll never every do it. single time. You'll never do it. So I just had to get up there and do it and then just get up there and do it again and get up there and do it again. And you find that the 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 like nervousness and the fear can kind of still be there. Because I mean, 100%. who wants to do an oral presentation every week of their <laughs> life and be judged for it? Um, and, but you find, and I, what I found with like with the first um, sermon in the last series, where like I just threw everything to the wind and yeah. trusted God. I found that it was like leading up to that was like it, it was terrifying because you're like, man, like I'm you're telling me to throw my notes out like I've got all this. Like, what do you mean? How am I going to go longer than 10 minutes? Like, this is going to suck. It's going to be terrible. Like, I'm going to drop the ball so bad. And then it's like when you finally just legitimately, you're just like, OK, and just let go. And you're like, God. I can't do this. Like, that's my prayer. Every time before I come on the stage, I, I, I kneel down and I'm like, I, I cannot do this yep. apart from you. It does not matter how much I prepared or how little I prepared. Like, maybe it was a bad whatever. Like, despite my weakness and even in what I would conceive or think is my strength, like, I can't do this without you. And, like, no yep. matter what, I walk up here knowing, knowing. It's never like, oh, I hope God... I hope the Holy Spirit meets mm -hmm. me here. I walk up here fully just trusting that God's going to meet me here no matter what. And I know, like, whatever comes out of my mouth is what he wants me to say. Um, and with that, it's just like when you truly let go and get to, and I don't mean to sound like I'm, like, you know, boasting or blasting myself or whatever, saying there's, like, levels. I just want to clarify because there's always, you know, there's yeah, always there's somebody. Always, like, always ah. someone. And it's like... It's not about me. I don't. I don't think about me. It's just when you when you truly just as like a testimony thing. When you truly like let go and let God, as cheesy as that is, when you just give up control yeah. fully, and you're just like, hey, do whatever you want to do. It's it is the most. I have never felt more fulfilled than when I do this now, fully letting Him do that. Like I I know this is His will for my life. I know it's my calling. Like and it is the most. No matter how bad my week is, whatever, yep. and I'll still feel bad sometimes after a sermon. Like you know, like oh, I don't really feel like I did a great job, but it's still I'm fulfilled. Yeah. And then you find that as you just you let go that one time, yeah. and it's hard. But then the next time you go to let go. It's not as hard. And the next time you go to let go, it's yeah. not as hard. And it's like and you, stop you just it. get used to, which it sounds weird to say, yeah. but yeah, you stop fighting it. Stop fighting and you you're realize, no longer exhausted. Yeah. But that goes back to take my yoke upon you. And you think yeah. about a yoke. And you realize the burden attached, is light. If, if, but that yoke, when you put a yoke on, not to make this longer than it needs to be, when you put that yoke on you and you're taking his yoke, if you're still fighting against it and he's walking one direction and you're fighting against it, like you said, yeah. it's going to be hard. It's going to be exhausting. But when you walk with him and let him lead the yoke and you take his yoke upon you, it's light. It's it easy. Is, it becomes it fulfilling. the most amazing. And thing. yeah, you just. It's, uh, there's, I, don't, I don't even think you can accurately describe it. If it is no. just when you, when you like that, yeah. when you take his yoke upon you and then let him lead you yep. and don't fight it at all. Don't fight it at all. I'm, Cause it is hard at first. You're going to get exhausted and it's hard. You know, it's, it's hard for a little bit, but when you just, you, you just literally give up and you crucify your mm -hmm. flesh and you're like, I'm, I'm just going to trust you. And you know, God's going to meet me no matter mm -hmm. what <laughs> the situation is. He will. God will meet me there. Your life that that is the piece that passes under. He's already at the finish line, like your dad said. And yeah, and then He's not to definitely. not to get long, but yeah. The yoke <laughs> take it on you. And if you fight against it long enough, that's what happens when people go when you see the people say, Oh, I tried the Jesus thing yeah. or I did it and I just didn't work and now I'm out of church. They became exhausted with church or they became burnt out. Yep. A lot of times they had Jesus' yoke upon them, but they kept fighting it and eventually they get so tired they collapse, they I don't want it anymore. And they take, take it, it off. off. It's a shame. Because they didn't fully let go. But yeah, we can close there. Yeah, that's great. No, I think that's good. So... 
Hey, I hope that message spoke to you today. I want to say thank you to everybody who is involved at Family Church and those who help support this ministry. If you would like to get more involved, you can click the link in the description or head to our website, familychurch.social. We would love to connect with you, and you can find all of our social media platforms on our website. Also, if this message spoke to you in any way today and you liked it, consider sharing it on your social media in any way that you would like so that we can help reach those far from God and return them to the arms of the Father. We want to see God work through you. We love you. Thanks again for listening. God bless you.